that were embarking on studies exploring consensus building national dialogues that produce social compacts. This too will be a resource for government and key social partners in our society to utilize as a resource for navigating and shaping our future trajectory. We meet in a Mandela month and we are reminded of his words in the twilight years of his public service as a public servant. It is in your hands. Indeed, it is now in our hands to shape the course of our history and to avert some of the worst case scenarios in our trajectory. And we are reminded of Franz Fanon writing in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, when he said, each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. We all know this moment. We are not where we were in 1994. And yet we are certainly not where we intended to be. At the crossroads, at this fogged road, we ask, what does the future hold? Perhaps we should be asking, who holds the future? We are, through this inflammatory work, in a dialogue with the future that can be and creating the future histories and future memories. We therefore implore you to seriously and continuously engage with inflammatory scenarios and periodic surveys, as well as economic simulations, as you try to make sense of unfolding events and trajectory of our country. Even more important is an invitation for all stakeholders from government to business and civil society to recognize the enormity, the enormity of the and complexity of our compounded challenges and embrace the spirit of co-creation and co-determination of a better cause uh, in our country and our quest for a socially just, inclusive, prosperous and united society. To this end, we encouraged by the ever-growing number of key societal stakeholders who have taken interest in the inflammatory work and followed with engagement and some partnerships. To that end, again, I end by saying it is in our hand in this Mandela month. I thank you. Thank you so much, Prof for setting the context for us today. And thank you for also introducing the audience to the three scenarios. For those who want a greater detail of the scenarios, please visit our website, sascenarios2030.co.za. Now, as part of the co-creation process and us consulting with various stakeholders, we had to engage with also the former president, Kalima Matlanto, who's going to be joining us and giving us the keynote address shortly. But as part of those briefings that we had with the former president, he emphasized the issue of agency, you know, questioning us whether we have thought clearly about agency, but also how we intend to mobilize social forces, especially those coming from the private sector to fall in. We all know that there is the issue of trust deficit that seems to be endemic across the spectrum. But also, what about land hunger? So as we proceed and looking at the process of refreshing the scenarios, we also had to take all these things into consideration along with the gray rhinos that Dr. Figeni spoke to. So now without wasting any time, I'd like to welcome former President Kalima Mutlante, who was the president of the country from 2008 to 2009. He was also deputy president from 2009 up until 2014. His Excellency, uh, former President Kalima Mutlante, over to you, sir. Uh, th thank you very much, Tolelo uh, Katia, uh, program director. 
uh, Professor Soma, Dr. Fikeni, Dr. Padili Wodra, Dr. Asga Adel Zadeh, Dr. Tara Paul Zanwatu, Mr. Andy Lesanu, and all eminent participants. Ladies and gentlemen, our ability to explore each other's points of views, beliefs, findings, and solutions is our strongest tool to discover how to steer the nation on a trajectory of recovery and cohesion. To engage in a national strategic conversation is to learn from one another, make collective decisions, and take action in a manner that serves the needs of a nation in trauma. The time for dialogue has never been more pressing in South Africa's democracy than it is now. As we examine the ingulamity scenarios and planning models, we gather again to deliberate on the research and quantified data and interpretations of science to understand what needs to be done to save South Africa from injustices of the past, injustices of the present, and injustices of poverty on people in future. Saving the country from the ravages of an escalating pandemic, saving the youth from a buckling education system and joblessness, saving hungry families from famine, saving businesses from collapse, saving the nation from violent tension and saving us all from the corrosion of unity. These are just some of the injustices that require our fullest attention and dedicated dialogue. The Indulamiti scenarios scoured South Africa's state of mind, state of being, and state of flux to get to grips with what is actually happening on the ground. Alongside ADRS's six pillar policy reforms and other possible post-COVID economic recovery pathways, we have certainly a lot to talk about. These series of conversation, however, must not stop here in the virtual dialogue. It is our duty and responsibility to discuss the findings and solutions widely and impose the data on those who should be listening and making decisions. It is also important to acknowledge that the discussions around scenario modeling are not new to South Africa and have been used to sway the country in the right direction in the past. The scenario planner and strategist Clem Center proposed models in the 1980s that influenced apartheid South Africa scenario of political settlement in contrast to the low road strategy of further violence and possible civil war. South Africa was in the grip of a decades long crisis in the 1980s and it was scenario planning that illuminated a possible pathway to democracy. The Montfleur scenario exercise in South Africa between 1991 and 1992 showed the power of models to bring people together, think collectively about their future and discover new ways forward with an out of the box approach. A climate of conflict and uncertainty was evident during the period between February 1990, when the late former president Nelson Mandela was released from Robben Island prison and the African National Congress together with the Pan-Africanist Congress and the South African Communist Party 
and other organizations were unbanned. And April 1994, when the first democratic elections were held. The following scenarios are the four models that they believed to be plausible and relevant at the time, and which were developed into logical narratives to communicate to the wider public. First was what they called ostrich, in which a negotiated settlement to the crisis in South Africa is not achieved and the country's government continues to be non-representative. The second was they called the lame duck, in which a settlement is achieved but the transition to a new dispensation is slow and indecisive. And the third they called Icarus, in which Transition is rapid, but the new government unwisely pursues unsustainable populist economic policies. And the fourth scenario they called flight of the flamingos, in which the government's policies are sustainable and the country takes a path of inclusive growth and democracy. Although the Montfleur project was part of a larger project of forums across the country and did not resolve the crisis in itself, the articulation of the Montfleur planners' visions contributed to a shared vocabulary that not only leads to draw on, but trade unions, communities, President, you are muted. Uh, President, if you can please unmute your microphone. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry about that. I didn't unmute myself. I didn't mute myself. Uh, I think the gremlins are in charge here. Uh, and I have no clue at what point uh, uh, did I uh, end up being muted. So should I take one step back perhaps? Yes, please, if you can, say, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah if, if I'm repeating what I've already said, uh, you'll bear with me then. The following scenarios are the four models that they believed to be plausible and relevant at the time, and which were developed into logical narratives to communicate to the wider public. The first was called the ostrich, in which a negotiated settlement to the crisis in South Africa is not achieved, and the country's government continues to be non-representative. The second they called lame duck, in which a settlement is achieved by the transition to a new dispensation is slow and indecisive. And the third they called Icarus, in which transition is rapid, but the new government unwisely pursues unsustainable populist economic policies. And the fourth scenario they called flight of the flamingos in which the government's policies are sustainable and the country takes a path of inconclusive growth or inclusive growth sorry and democracy although the montfleur project was part of a larger project of forums across the country and did not resolve the crisis in itself the articulation of the Montfleur planners' visions contributed to a shared vocabulary that not only leaders could draw on, but trade unions, communities, civil society, the private sector, and ordinary people could use as a language for dialogue. 
This dialogue boosted a common understanding between parties and people and created a climate that lent itself towards promoting mutual agreement and settlement. The purpose of Montflair was not to present definitive truths, but to stimulate debate on how to shape the next 10 years. By the end of 1992, the project had met its measures of success and the team dissolved. Similarly, in 1997, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, COSATU, had a commission led by Connie September, which dealt with uh, scenarios and <clears throat> sought to provoke debate and highlight critical challenges within the Federation through the use of three scenarios. Kosatu noted that the three scenarios were not stories about the strategies of Kosatu itself, more so they were stories about the forces and factors outside of Kosatu that the Federation deemed as beyond its control. The September Commission presented the following three scenarios. The first was called the desert, the second was called Sporoporo, and the third was called Pap, Flace, and Gravy. Under the desert, the report said the following. And in this scenario, there is no economic development, no RDP delivery, and a high level of class conflict. South Africa finds itself in the desert instead of the promised land of the reconstruction and development plan. Could socialism provide the way out of the desert and towards the promised land? The question was posed. There are massive demonstrations against the worsening conditions of the masses and placards are seen asking questions such as, where is the RGP? Where is the promised land? And where are the masses in the desert? Where is our Moses? Powerful organizations of the unemployed, the youth and communities emerge while the government tains a number of leaders. Government leaders promise to look into the people's legitimate grievances, but warn against false prophets who mislead the people. And under this Korokoro scenario, uh, the report said, in this scenario, there is some economic growth and modest delivery. The main features are on the one hand, increasing social fragmentation and conflict, and on the other hand, the rapid self-empowerment of black business and the black middle class. South Africa is a scorocoro zigzagging from problem to problem. Ethnicity, racism, provincialism, and regionalism become very powerful as a result of lack of delivery and conflict over resources. Patronage and corruption become the order of the day in government and in civil society. On the ground, there is a lack of cooperation and violent conflict in communities and on the shop floor. The rainbow nation does not exist. The culture of self-enrichment and the growth of a black middle class could undermine the union's culture of solidarity. And under the pap and pap flays and gravy, in this scenario, there is massive economic growth and development. Jobs are created and the RDP delivers. There is pap and flays for most people. The unions are involved in deal-making, joint decision-making, 
and core determination at all levels of society. But are they getting caught in the gravy? The question was posed. Over the next six years, that is from 1997 onward, there is tremendous growth in all sectors. All kinds of small, medium companies flourish. This means that there is a wide range of new jobs and new workers. Many women are employed in low paid and vulnerable sectors. For example, seasonal workers in the tourist industry. Millions of people are still unemployed and many work in the informal sector. Companies are under tremendous competitive pressures. Managers put pressure on workers and their unions to assist in improving productivity and quality and to work harder, faster, and smarter. This is also continual pressure for wage moderation in the private and public sectors. Over the years, the RDP delivery increases Millions of houses are built, but there are still huge check settlements. Despite tremendous progress, the successes of the new South Africa seem shaky. There are questions over the political direction of the ANC government and over the prospects for a continued economic growth. Will there be PAP? and place for most people who will get the gravy? What about those who have still not benefited from growth or the RDP? Also intended to stimulate action-oriented conversation among the public sector, private sector, and citizens, where the denouking scenarios of 2008 in its summary and conclusion, the Nukeng scenario team posed the following critical questions about the future of our country. One, how can we as South Africans address our critical challenges before they become time bombs that destroy our accomplishments? Two, what can each one of us do in our homes, communities, and workplaces to help build a future that lives up to the promise of 1994. The Dinukeng Scenario Project stated that although South Africa had achieved a great deal, there were also serious mistakes that threatened the future. Many difficulties similar to the crisis at the dawn of democracy still haunted South Africa at that time. With critical economic and social challenges in relation <clears throat> to unemployment, poverty, safety and security, education and health. All of which were exacerbated by the global financial crisis of 2008. <clears throat> The Dinukeng scenarios offered three possible ways that South Africa might walk into and so create a result we walk apart. In this scenario, the state becomes increasingly weak and ineffective. A disengaged and self-protective citizenry eventually loses patience and erupts into protest and unrest. The state, driven by its inability to meet citizens' demands and expectations, responds brutally and a spiral of resistance and repression is unleashed. The message of Walk Apart is that if we fail to address our critical challenges, if we fail to build state capacity, and if citizens do not organize to engage government constructively, we will experience rapid disintegration and decline. The second they called, we walk behind, 
In this scenario, the state becomes increasingly strong and directive, both enabled and by enabling a civil society that is increasingly dependent and compliant. The state grows in its confidence to lead and direct development. However, it does not by itself have the capacity to address uh, critical challenges effectively. The demands of socioeconomic development and redistributive justice amid a global and domestic economic crisis place strain on the state's capacity to serve all. The message of work behind is that state-led development cannot succeed if state capacity is seriously lacking. In addition, a state that intervenes pervasively and, and that dominates all other sectors will crowd out private initiative by business and civil society and create a complacent and dependent citizenry. The third scenario was called, we walk together. This scenario tells the story of a state that becomes increasingly catalytic and collaborative of an enabling state that listens to its citizens and leaders from different sectors, a state that engages with critical voices that consults and shares authority in the interest of long-term sustainability. This is also a story of an engaged citizenry that takes leadership and holds government accountable, a citizenry that shares responsibility for policy outcomes and development. The message of work together is that we can address our critical challenges only if citizens, groups, business, labor, and broader civil society actively and effectively engage with the state to improve delivery and enforce an accountable government. South Africa's past relationships with scenario modeling clearly illustrates how this methodology for planning can be a valuable tool for organizations ranging from government to educational institutions, investment firms, organized labor and communities to evaluate possible future events. By analyzing the discrepancies between possible futures, a decision, decision, makers, decision makers can facilitate research into how their decisions around certain situations could directly impact the country. By creating a multitude of possible scenarios, entering varying inputs of data, and then contrasting them against a the common basis, scenario modeling offers a definite and unmistakable advantage over traditional forecasting. Ladies and gentlemen, after 2008, for reasons that hopefully Dr. Padile Ota and the Ingulamiti Scenarios team could elaborate on, the project and methodology of scenario planning dwindled and fell away. It was with the dawn of the Ingulamiti South Africa Scenarios 2017 that scenarios were resurrected with a team of economists, researchers, business leaders, and passionate activists to create a new set of models that offer South Africa the potential to future proof uh, itself. We are undoubtedly at another crossroads in the development of South Africa and today's layered crisis present an opportunity to decide what is important to us and how we respond to a moving target. 
In 2018, the Ndulamiti South Africa Scenario 2030 released the forecast of what South Africa could look like by 2030 and named three possible futures. It's Bujwa, Nayilewok, or Guarabara. Isi bourgeois, an enclave bourgeois nation torn by deepening social divides, daily protests, and cynical self interest. Nailewok, a nation in step with itself, where growing social cohesion, economic expansion, and a renewed spirit of constitutionalism get South Africa going and Guara Guara, a floundering false dawn, a demoralized land of disorder and decay. Several years later, and at a time of great challenge and despair, the Ndulamiti scenarios now offer an updated iteration that differs to past scenarios in that they have now instituted the Ndulamiti barometer which monitors levels of social cohesion to determine which scenario the country is tracking towards. How South Africa fares in the three possible future depends on the consideration of three key driving forces in the Ndulamiti barometer, which consists of 53 indicators that underpin the scenario narratives. The driving forces include one, resistance, resentment, and reconciliation. Two, institutional capacity and leadership. Three, social inequality. The results for each key driving force tell us in which direction we are teetering towards. Is it Nailewok, is it Bourgeois, or Guara Guara? and provides vital information with the intention to foster necessary dialogue to reach consensus in building a socially cohesive future. Each scenario shows the impact, political, economic, and social, of differing levels of social cohesion. The monitoring and evaluation gives us an authoritative insight into the elements that should influence the country's decision-making, namely South Africa's overall reflection on socioeconomic and political challenges, the lack of strategic thinking for the future, and the many ways in which organizations and individuals can utilize the Indrulamity tools in their own planning to imagine alternative pathways to a socially cohesive nation. Consequently, the Ndulamiti barometer and scenarios offer a chance for the nation to examine the fundamental changes over the past few years and to investigate these changes in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. South Africa and indeed the world are trying to catch up with this evolving situation endeavoring to make sense of how and where to move their pieces on an unstable chessboard. However, the rules that govern how safely move across the squares have changed. What the Indulamity Barometer has designed is a mechanism to accurately and succinctly manage our perceptions and bias versus the hard facts of data. The Indulamity barometer reveals what needs to be addressed and what opportunities exist to rebuild our political, economic, and our social structures in an ever-changing environment. As the world rapidly morphs and alters itself, while at the same time in a seemingly constant fight or flight mode, we find ourselves responding to acute stress 
in a way that keeps us all on a heightened level of defense. Our automatic reaction, physiological and psychological, is a collective reflex on a perceived harmful threat to our survival. Indeed, there are threats to our survival and more so in a changing world with COVID-19. The nervous system of the world is under increasing strain and so embracing the maxim that the only constant in life is change is perhaps one way for us to navigate ourselves through the extreme disruptions that are testing the strength of our democracy. Indeed, change brings fear as well as hope. And it is for this reason why the Indulamiti scenario 2030 is an essential tool for government, policymakers, businesses, civil organizations, communities, and all of society to conceive, plan, and then construct any kind of future for a South Africa that we dream of. Working parallel to this constant change of life is the Indulamiti barometer, which tracks, records, and responds to this change. In fact, the barometer's calibration is designed to feed off and function because of change. Following, probing, and examining the country's change, the Indulamiti barometer presents us with hard facts that keep our opinions and visions of South Africa grounded with updated reality checks that allow us to more accurately investigate the direction that South Africa is moving towards. So when we find ourselves up against the compound effect of multiple crises on top of tough historic challenges, we are placed in a position where the projects of nation building and inclusive economic growth become elusive and somewhat fantastical. However, as the central nervous system of South Africa comes under attack and the nation's already rapid heart rate and high blood pressure increases further to breaking point, we are offered some confidence in the knowledge that we have primed the body for action with a powerful tool for influencing decision-making. With the Inglulamiti barometer, we are better prepared to perform under pressure and cope effectively with mounting threats. We can see them coming, we can track them down, we can strike with evidence-based intelligence, and we can allow the data to play a critical role in our survival. The current tension and conflict across South Africa's landscape alongside the suffering and loss of pandemic, a pandemic that hammers a society already broken by poverty, begs us to ask the following questions. What has changed? Where have we come from? How has COVID-19 changed South Africa in ways that we can learn from? The need for survival of families further exacerbated by rising poverty and agitated by grief fuels a sense of rage below the surface. The pre-COVID state in South Africa was not desirable or conducive to the Nile walk scenario. There was already a loss of normalcy for communities, the fear of economic decline was already entrenched. The loss of human connection was already apparent in the rising rate of gender-based violence and hate crime. And the anticipation of further loss was already a dark cloud, adding to the gloomy psyche of a nation at war with itself. 
While the global focus is on recovering from COVID-19, the 2021 in Lulamiti Barometer and Economic Model highlights the neglected threats and solutions, including the Applied Development Research Solutions, Six Pillar Policy Reforms, and other possible post-COVID economic recovery pathways to lead us to Nai Lewok scenario. It is important for us to acknowledge that within Rulamiti scenarios, we can find meaning in the process of economic and social recovery and that through the data, we can find a way to heal. The 2021 in Barometer shows a striking dimension of social inequality that leaves us dragging far behind other developing nations and way off the mark of where we had planned to be this far into democracy. Unfortunately, the Guara Guara scenario rears its ugly head in this situation and is sustained by the underlying socioeconomic beasts of unemployment, poverty, poor health care, a failing education system, and lack of safety. When considering isolation and segregation, the quarantine and lockdown measures are essential to stop epidemics. However, this long-term isolationism leads to economic collapse without offering any real protection against infectious disease. These characteristics are evident in the findings of the 2021 Inulamity Barometer. The data shows it. History, however, shows us that real protection arises from the sharing and use of reliable information from collective vision, national and international solidarity, and decision-making based on these principles. It could be said that the antidote to the challenges of COVID-19 and associated challenges is collaboration and cooperation but with institutional capacity and leadership stumbling into the Guara Guara dimension at 43% in the 2021 barometer, the data shows that there is less rather than more of the crucial antidote to a land of disorder and decay. The barometer shows us that by February, 2020, we had crossed the halfway mark into the realms of the Guara Guara scenario. But where will we be in three months, next year, or 10 years from now? With the Indulamiti scenarios and barometer, we can learn from our past, explore our possible futures, and indeed discover that within every crisis, there is also opportunity. There are a number of possible futures for South Africa and together with the Mangongobje Institute for Strategic Reflection, the Ingula Miti South Africa Scenarios 2030, scientists, philosophers, policy makers, creative minds and civil society organizations and gathered here, we hope to paint a of a picture of various scenarios and map out possible pathways to create a South Africa we know we all deserve. With all this information at our fingertips and a nation slipping into a state of guara guara, the question that begs to be asked is, who is listening? Who is taking the initiative to utilize these reports? What steps are being taken to ensure that South Africa is pulled out of the dull drums of Guara Guara? All this is dependent on how government, the private sector, and 
society respond collectively. We understand that dialogue among equals will provide a platform to discover, share, and achieve a greater common good through knowledge. This gives us a sense of autonomy to determine the future we know South Africa deserves. This gives us hope, but what we also understand is that hope is not enough. To carry out our aspirations, we also need a solid action plan that is amplified by leadership consensus and the conviction of many. Enter the Indulamiti Social Compacting Initiative that builds on the rich legacy of engagement in South Africa between all stakeholders through social dialogue to address and resolve deep-seated societal conflicts. This participatory process creates a platform for reflection, mutual understanding, and motivation for a broad cross-section of society to unite through the principles of a social contract that guides us. Harnessing the power of dialogue, a compact acts as a social initiative that is underpinned by active citizenship and the pursuit of greater social cohesion as a pivotal point of national interest. The Inglulamity Social Compacting Initiative reinforces and echoes the significance and weight of one of the world's most progressive and inclusive social compacts, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. As the supreme law of the land, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa sets the bar for which we should live up to and for which our renewal as a nation can be fully realized. But as the Indulamiti scenarios and barometer have highlighted, are we living up to that bar? Through the malice of pervasive corruption, a weakened state and mounting poverty, have we placed ourselves in danger of compromising our constitutional democracy, of destroying democratic culture, of eroding the trust of the people? What of our commitment to uphold the constitution? At today's Indulamity Day virtual conference, and in all spheres of life, it is imperative for us all to add value to the discourse and to further unpack the implications of our possible futures against the backdrop of the constitution. Allow me for a moment to review the basic provisions of the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. And I quote, a constitution is a body of fundamental principles according to which a state is, gov is to be governed. It sets out how all the elements of government are organized and contains rules about what power is wielded, who wields it, and over whom it is wielded in the governing of a country. It can be seen as a kind of contract between those in power and those who are subjected to this power. It defines the rights and duties of citizens and the mechanisms that keep those in power in check, close quote. The Indulamity Scenarios Barometer and Social Compacting Initiative are tools for us to breathe into to breathe life into the constitution, to embrace its principles and to decisively take action in a manner that we can step together in a choreographed harmony to reach a future naive lewok. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to conclude by stating that in this climate of uncertainty and fluid change, 
what may stabilize the vital signs of our country are the choices we can make. We can even choose to live by principles that guide our choices and strengthen our conviction. We can live by these characteristics of ethical leadership and unite a nation at odds with itself. We can choose our attitude. We can choose how hard to fight. We can choose how much empathy we have for others. We can choose to listen and take action based on research. Life demands of us that we embrace change. And it is with the Indulamities South Africa Scenarios 2030 that we can make informed choices that reflect our principles of humanity and carve out a new productive, equitable, and inclusive future for all. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, former President Mutlante, for that keynote address. What I take from it is that it was a very stern reminder of the fact that South Africa and scenarios have a long history. The process of building scenarios informed our transition. You mentioned the Manfleur scenarios all the way up to our Indulamiti scenarios. So this is nothing new for this country. But most importantly, what sets us apart as Indulamiti is the barometer that we have designed to track the progress across the different scenarios. Now, I just want to remind those who joined us late to please ensure that your microphones and your cameras are off at all times. I'd like us to also revisit the Mentimeter. Those who have not been able to contribute, if you can quickly take out a different device, whether it's a cell phone or open a new tab on your laptop so that you can also contribute. The request was that you write a word or a phrase describing what South Africa would be like in 2030. And once again, if you can look at your screen, you can see that it's still very hopeful. Most prominent are the words recovering, hopeful, better, and rebuilding. So without wasting any further time, I'd like to call upon Dr. Tara Paul Sanguato from Social Service. Now we've been working with Social Service for some time now. We first partnered with Social Service in 2019 when there was this call from our stakeholders to actually start uh, this barometer so that we can determine which way the country was going as many stakeholders felt that it was not enough to only tell the stories but to also uh, raise our flags from time to time. So now Tara is going to be presenting the latest barometer results, which is actually the main business of today. Now, this was done by actually using our key driving forces that were already mentioned by previous speakers, which is inequality, resistance, uh, resentment, reconciliation, but also issues and challenges of uh, leadership. Now, over to you, Tara, so that you can give us the latest results. I know some in the comments section have already asked where we are today. So this next presentation is going to do precisely that. Thank you. Thank you, Olelua, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to present the third iteration of the Indulamiti National Barometer at a time when, as we've been hearing and seeing and experiencing in our own lives these last days, long-term evidence-based perceptions and, and data on social cohesion in South Africa are more relevant than ever. The purpose of the barometer, as we've heard, is to support conversations across all of South Africa by annually tracking the extent to which South Africa is moving towards one of the three Indulamiti scenarios. Um, I would like to invite all of you who are on Menti 
to um, move on to the next question. Uh, which scenario do you see South Africa being in at the moment? And uh, as I continue my presentation, that data will keep collecting in the background. Um, if you can go to uh, menti.com, the link at the top there, or it's also in the chat, and then we'll come back and see where all of you think we currently are. So why a barometer? And especially why a barometer in a crisis? Uh, it would seem that as soon as you have something unexpected, COVID, uh, perhaps the events of the last few days, um, that a barometer doesn't help you to predict these things. But in fact, it's the most important period to have a longer term view. The point about scenarios is also not that they help us predict exactly what will happen, but that they enable us to be almost vaccinated, as the president said. They, they help us to get ready for something that may uh, uh, attack us in the future, something that may uh, come to pass. And one of the reasons scenarios are such powerful tools for influencing decision-making at the individual level, but especially at the societal level, is because they combine storytelling and hard facts. The storytelling links with our emotions and it allows us to feel what it would be like to live in the scenarios, either the ones we hope for or the ones we hope to avoid. The hard facts, they ensure that we keep our stories realistic, that we have a shared basis for conversation across different parts of our society and that we can regularly check our biases and assumptions against something concrete. So especially in a crisis when everything seems to be changing even faster and more fundamentally than usual, we need ways of anchoring our reactions to some longer term perspective. When tracking our annual progress against the scenarios, we need to maintain both the power of the storytelling and the factual basis. And that's why our annual Indulamiti tracking process has both components. One based on stories and uh, perceptions about key events of the year, and one based on clearly defined empirical indicators. Now, both are equally valid. They just tell us about our experiences as a country in different ways. So let's start with a review of some of the key events of the year and what they tell us about where we are in terms of the scenarios. We've organized these events again by the key driving forces that we've heard about, but also whether the event relates to COVID-19 or not. Uh, it's really important at this point to remember that just because COVID-19 has had such a major impact on our lives these last 18 months, there are many institutions, processes, and trends that preceded it and that remain in place or which are happening in parallel. So with each briefly mentioned event, you will see a barometer icon on the right. You'll see there pointing to yellow on the right if the event indicates the growth and cohesion of the Naili walk scenario, pointing to green on the, sorry, to um, green on the left if the event is an indicator of weakness and dissolution as described in the Guara Guara scenario, or pointing to the turquoise in the middle for the muddling through inequality of the easy bourgeois scenario. Some events point in two directions at once if they indicate a weakness, which is nonetheless being addressed through functioning institutions. So let's start with institutional capacity and leadership, things that are not COVID-19 related. And let's start with our region. So this past year, in the last 12 months, the African continental free trade area began trading on the 1st January, uh, 2021. This has created the largest free trade area in the world. Many of us may have actually forgotten that this happened. This is very significant. And it's creating and will continue creating many new economic opportunities for South Africa. The future of the country is inexorably linked to the future of the region and the continent. So this is actually an important step towards Naila Walk. Another example of South Africa's link to the wider world is more ambivalent. The original scenario stories predicted that South Africa would get its first IMF loan in 2027 as part of the Guara Guara scenario. And here we are getting an IMF loan in 2020. However, if we are to get a loan, perhaps it's better to get an emergency COVID loan with relatively few conditionalities. 
it's certainly not an embarrassment to join much of the rest of the developing world in seeking financial assistance at this time. Now, when we look at institutions and leadership at the national level, we have several major events of ambivalent significance for the scenarios in the last weeks. The constitutional court findings and subsequent imprisonment of our former president could be read as a sign of political decay, or in fact, as institutional strength in the judiciary and law enforcement services. Just as developments in the ruling party around sanctions against members accused of corruption are both signs of internal tension and policy decisiveness. The continuation of regular load shedding, however, signaling the lack of institutional and planning and implementation capacity over decades to stabilize, stabilize the national power supply continues to squarely be in the Guara Guara scenario like last year. There are some signs, however, that a social compact around energy is emerging, which may improve not only the reliability of energy supply, but model social compacting at industry level. So again, that's a, a, an in-between scenario indicator. Whereas some of the country's national institutions like the judiciary remain strong, others have shown increasing weakness again this year including the public protector. Similarly, in our institutions of the future, our universities, we once again saw multiple levels of institutional weakness within student organizations, university management, the relevant national departments, and the police services. Moving to examples of local level institutional capacity and leadership, we had several major examples of how mismanagement and lack of adequate prevention can result in crisis. The blazes in Cape Town and at Charlotte Matrike Hospital in Johannesburg. So all of the events I've mentioned up until now from regional to local level are examples of institutional strengths or weaknesses that were present before COVID-19 and have continued largely independently of the pandemic. There are also important elements of institutional capacity and leadership which relate directly to COVID-19. These include the president's regular communication with the public, both statesmanlike and fatherly, calming fears, taking decisions with clarity and transparency. Government's ability to shift so much of its operations online, including all parliamentary proceedings, has accelerated many forms of transparency considered impossible just 18 months ago as well as saving millions on travel costs. COVID-19 has also accelerated the push to reform and renew other deliberative forums such as NEDLAC, resulting in some significant new social compacting efforts around the economic recovery plan, the ESCOM social compact and expansion of the UIF beneficiaries through the TERS. These are important both for their outcomes once again and for the compacting processes themselves which brought together interests across the community, government, labor, and the private sector. On the other hand, of course, COVID-19 also provided opportunities for corruption at many levels. At the same time, our investigative media was strong enough to expose such activities, and at least some of those responsible, even at the highest levels, were brought to book. Finally, our healthcare system, while extremely stretched, did not collapse. While perhaps not all private and public sector cap capacities are currently being used optimally, everyone is working together around the vaccine effort. While starting slowly, the tech-enabled vaccine program is now picking up momentum. Uh, of course, in the next last couple of days disrupted again, but uh, we certainly hope it will regain the momentum it was starting to have. And as is so often the case, if you look for unexpected capacity in leadership, they can be found. So now let's look at the key driving force, social inequality. Even as COVID-19 dominated everything social and economic in these past 12 months, there have been some encouraging responses with, positive, with potential positive legacies for future scenarios. 
One is the relatively fast and widespread introduction of the social relief of distressed grant and the digitally enabled systems built to support them. In addition to the estimate 20 billion paid out to the unemployed through the social relief of distress grant, the UIF has paid over 60 billion to workers over the COVID period using relaxed qualification criteria that enabled much more inclusive access than previously. Although the abrupt end of the grant payout and uncertainty about the UIF liquidity for the current lockdown period has been a major challenge for many households across the country. The policy discussion about the universal basic income grant has been pushed forward greatly, as will be discussed later on at this event. Again, something that is very much future looking. Major public employment programs were put in place. And even if they were only for short periods of time, the online recruitment, hiring, training, and payment systems established have now set precedents for removing barriers in future similar programs. At the same time as digitalization has progressed to pace in employment and training and education, it has, of course, also excluded or disadvantaged many, deepening the digital divide and increasing many forms of inequality, as predicted by the East Bourgeois scenario. And so the digital inequality element that was already building has in some ways been accelerated in these last six, 18 months. Many other forms of inequality have deepened without any silver linings. Uh, the increase in interpersonal violence has been extreme when we were already among the most violent countries in the world. And socioeconomic inequality overall has widened not only reinforcing existing inequality by race, but also by gender. So that really does pose the question, how much more inequality can a country take before it splits apart or erupts? Perhaps the most telling indicator of all that we have reached the Guara Guara scenario is that food insecurity has tripled in the last year from 5% in our last barometer to 17%, with a worsening outlook to 20%, especially in KZN. This is according to uh, tracking by the UN. That's one in every five people in the country. Food insecurity is the most direct and extreme expression of what the loss of incomes and the unequal distribution of basic resources really feels like. I don't know how many people on this call have felt hunger. It's a feeling that you don't ever forget. In South Africa, income poverty immediately translates into hunger because of the deep structural histories around the misappropriation of land and the destruction of subsistence agriculture, knowledge and, uh, and values, both rural and urban. Food prices have risen globally over the last 12 months which historically correlates strongly with political unrest across our continent and across the world, witnessed the food price riots in Cuba this week and the relationship between food prices and the Arab Spring protests a decade ago. It may not be much of a comfort today that we are not the exception and we are not alone, but it certainly focuses the mind on where history tells us we may be headed. So now just let's look at resistance, resentment and reconciliation very briefly. Um, this is about how South Africans feel about each other. Uh, so this is one of those places where South Africa is quite specific. We have our own tropes that we keep coming back to. Long standing unresolved questions of race have not of course disappeared. They remain core to how political parties are seen, how political parties mobilize, how people interact with each other in public and private spaces. The last few days in KZN in particular have also taken on a racial narrative in some ways. On the other hand, there are increasingly new ways of speaking about privilege and structural whiteness, which are opening up avenues for organizations and individuals to engage with questions of transformation in new and possibly more constructive ways which is why we have this as the Isi Bourgeois scenario and not quite yet as Guara Guara. 
There have also been some impressive collaborations across race and class around COVID-19 relief donations with ordinary citizens along with corporates contributing to a major effort through institutions such as the Solidarity Fund and others. But then we have the events of the past week, bringing together all the trends and contradictions from across all the three key driving forces, the justice system and party politics, deep social need, food insecurity, and erupting frustration with a status quo state and economy that are experienced as deeply unjust, and a rule of law which is seen to represent and protect both the unjust state and economy in many ways by many people. So it is particularly at such a disrupted time that we must complement our analysis of major events with a view of more structural underlying trends. This is what the Inglulimiti barometer allows us to do. As we've already heard, the barometer combines 53 indicators, all of which are based on data published by reputable national and international organizations. Each indicator represents a dimension within one of the three key driving forces that underpin the scenario narratives. <clears throat> As an example, under state capacity, we have auditor general report results for state entities and the reliability of public services provision in power and water. For each indicator, we determined which outcomes would fall into which scenario. For example, to measure state capacity at the local level, we look at municipal functionality. If over 50% of municipalities receive a clean audit from the Auditor General, we would be in Nailiwok. If between 20 and 50% had clean audits, we would be in Isibujo. Less than that, and we are in Guaraguara. This year, the Auditor General reported 8% clean municipal bills. So good decision requires good information, as the former president told us just now information that cuts through the noise of too much data and the noise of the ever-changing news cycle while not oversimplifying a complex idea like social cohesion. So before we actually show the barometer findings, let me just very briefly mention another important finding of the barometer process, which is that there's a big gap in our institutional national capacity in terms of measuring key indicators for the country's well-being success. Many of the most important goals we say we have set ourselves to reduce poverty and inequality, achieve climate sustainability, improve education and health, we actually can't know if we are succeeding because we are not measuring these things regularly. In 2020, 2021, this data paucity was exacerbated by COVID disruptions to regular surveys. For example, the census has been delayed, other data collection exercises as well. This resulted just technically as a note in some changes to our indicators, but this hasn't affected the continuity of the barometer findings. So what does the barometer tell us about the scenario South Africa is headed into after the past 12 months? Let's have a quick look at what people are feeling. Aha. So these are your results. 56% of you think we are currently in Guaraguara, 41 say we are in Isibujua, and only 4% think we are currently in uh, the Nailewak scenario. All right, so let's see. Let's look at this by key driving force first, before we look at the overall aggregate. Within resistance, resentment, and reconciliation, so how we feel about each other. Uh, this is put together out of uh, 11 indicators. 50% of those indicators point us into the Guaraguara scenario. This is the first time we've had a majority, almost a majority in this scenario in the last three years. If we look at institutional capacity and leadership, still quite balanced still quite a few indicators looking good as well as middling. Once again, however, this year, if we look at social inequality, we see completely unsustainable levels. 
when we compare ourselves with targets the countries had set itself as well as international comparisons. We see that the underlying socioeconomic conditions for the majority of South Africans in terms of employment, health, education, safety, are pulling us very, very strongly into the divisive Guara Guara scenario. This year, compared with last year, the indicator for food security dropped from Isibujwa into Guara Guara, as already mentioned. The one positive indicator within the social inequality dimension is that overall life expectancy is still rising. If we compare ourselves with last year, we see a worsening of the scenario trends in every single key driving force. I'm not going to go into the specific indicators that changed for reasons of time, but um, you will we'll be able to see this on the website as well as um, through this shared presentation afterwards. So overall, where are we? When we combine the three key driving forces, we see that the barometer for 2021 puts us squarely in the Guara Guara scenario, almost two thirds of the way into the Guara Guara scenario, a land of disorder and decay. This is not a single story. There are indicators that show that other scenarios are still possible, but it is a significant decline compared to previous years. In only three years, South Africa has gone from 46% to 59% in the Guara Guara scenario. We do also annually do a perception survey. I will go through this very quickly because there are other presentations and we do want to have a discussion. But it is important to note that in, in addition to having good data, you also need an awareness of the need for change and a desire to change and a sense that change is possible. So this perception survey was done in June before the riots of the past few days. Um, we asked a thousand people which scenario they foresee coming through in the next 12 months. The respondents represent a good spread of voices across gender, race, age, employment, status, and province. So overall, South Africans are a fairly optimistic bunch. Almost a quarter see a socially cohesive South Africa emerging in the next 12 months. But the picture is less optimistic than last year, when 27% predicted Naili Wok and 43% predicted Guara Guara. If we did the same survey this week, of course, I'm sure the results would be different. As in previous years, we see that younger South Africans under 20 remain the most optimistic. Uh, in terms of employment status, this optimistic age effect is also clear when we look at students. What we look at when we see the unemployed is that there is a group that is more optimistic than the employed. If you can see the yellow bar at the top there, 23% foresee a hopeful Naili Wok, but most of the unemployed predict or perhaps simply experience today's everyday reality of the Guara Guara scenario. So overall, the sense of hope has significantly decreased in our perception survey findings. We launched the provincial barometer last year, and the idea there was to look for places of dialogue and places of compacting that were not just at the national level. This year, we are not pre presenting a, a, a provincial dialogue that's comparable to last year's because there simply is insufficient data for year-on-year -year comparison. Um, but we do have some points just very briefly of hope here. We can see that this is a perception survey. Um, we can see, um, we can see that uh, in some provinces, there is a lot more hope than in others. So Limpopo, more respondents saw that or perceive that social inequality is actually decreasing. Again, in Limpopo, there's a sense by more people than in other provinces that institutional capacity and leadership is getting better. There is a, a sense of hope for reconciliation, 31% in the Eastern Cape, 26% in the Northwest. 
So there are places of hope, um, sometimes in unexpected places. All right, so that brings me finally to our conclusion. The barometer is designed to focus on us on where we are so that we can have a conversation about where we want to go from here. We have stepped through the doorway of Guaraguara and we will need an extraordinary effort to turn around, to fill in the deep social inequality cracks in the foundation of our country. So how do we get to a socially cohesive Naili walk from here? Before the next presentation gives us some ideas for a path ahead, I ask you to go back to Menti and reflect on what you personally can do right now to shift this story. What of the key driving forces can you personally work towards improving? We'll come back and see what you all said here, but let me pass it back to Hulelwa now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very sad uh, presentation, uh, Tara, but uh, I guess it's not surprising. As we are giving our input towards the Mentimeter, it would be also you know, prudent for me to just reflect on the comments wherein participants in this meeting are starting to offer themselves or volunteer themselves uh, in terms of responding to this question, where to from here, with the deep understanding of the fact that we all have to fall in, we all have to rally together as citizens so that we can realize a compact or some kind of common vision. The former president, Mutlante, also suggested that the constitution may offer us that North Star that can guide us towards that. As Indula Miti, we also have started a number of initiatives to try and respond to this. One of those initiatives is to research and explore the idea of social compacting so that we understand uh, instances where in social compacts have been successful and where they have failed. Another project that we've embarked on is that of economic modeling, which is led by Dr. Aska Adzadeh from ADRS. Now, Aska is based in the US and I'm sure it is 4 a.m. on his end. And we appreciate that he's been so patient. He was up at 2 a.m. to give this presentation. So I'd like to hand over to Asga, who is very familiar with the South African situation from the days of the RDP. Over to you, Asga, with the post-COVID economic outlooks that are likely for our country, or rather some choices that we might have to make as a way of charting the way forward. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh Thank you, Valela, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, uh, a lot has already been uh, covered. I, um, I, my presentation will be to some extent narrower than uh, what Tara presented, more on the, the economics of the uh, uh, side of the, the Indulumiti uh, scenarios. Um, as you all know, uh, South Africa has been experiencing an ongoing uh, economic crisis. Um, the, I'm just getting my uh, bearing. Um, characterized by high rates of uh, low economic growth, high unemployment rate, high poverty, and, and high inequality. Um, and and the uh, and as the as these graph shows in the last uh, 25 years, if you look at the South Africa's economic growth, the uh, the average growth rate has been 2.2 percent from 1996 to 2020. 2.2 percent. And if you take the population growth into consideration, the GDP per capita for the last 25 years, the average is less than one percent. It's 0.64%, almost half a percent. Very 
basically a chronic low economic growth has been the characteristics of, of South Africa's post-1994 or post-1996 period. Similarly, with respect to unemployment rate, as you all know, in the last 20 years, South Africa's unemployment, official unemployment rate has been above 20%. And with respect to, if you use the, un, uh, the expanded definition of the unemployment, it has been over the last 20 years above 30%. The unemployment rate has been above 30%. About half of the population, more or less 50% of the population live uh, living in poverty and income inequality has continuously worsened and is now considered uh, the highest in the world. So, um, so this, as, as the country plans, looking at these uh, facts, as the country plans for the post-COVID-19 era, the most a uh, pressing question on everyone's mind is, what will that recovery look like and mean to South Africans? Will the post-COVID recovery keep the economy on the current guara guara path that uh, Tara highlighted and we have been experiencing the last uh, couple of years, two, three years? Will the recovery mean uh, return to weak economic performance of pre-COVID-19? The one I just summarized with the benefit of growth mainly also going to the top layer of the population and relatively a small amount try, uh, trickle down to the rest. In other words, we're gonna have a, uh, a bourgeois kind of uh, decade. Or will the recovery mean recovering, actually recovering from the country's chronic uh, crisis and realizing uh, poor pool nail walk outcomes? Now, Together, these questions boils down to which Indululumiti scenario will South Africa follow during the next 10 years? Now, to answer this question, we've used a, a, a model of uh, South African economy that has been developed by ADRS. It's a replicate of the complex South African economy. It includes uh, diverse uh, nine provinces, their interrelationship, their industrial relationships, and, and people. It captures the laws of motion of the South African economy in terms of behavior of the private sector, households, and other uh, players. It captures the diversity of the, 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 the population as it is captured by a stats assays, uh, household survey and income expenditure survey, uh, so that we can look at the the impact of scenarios, impact of policies on households, on individuals, on demand for social securities and, and taxations and, and poverty and inequality. And also how the welfare of the private, uh, uh, households impact the economy as a whole and individual uh, households or how the economy is connected to the rest of the world uh, and, and impacted by the uh, rest, of the, uh, uh, rest of the world. Um, the model allows us, therefore, to consider uh, as, a, as a tool, it allows us to uh, consider policy choices using a wide range of what-if scenarios. And by using the model to produce likely effects of various what-if scenario, we're able to identify and quantify what the future possibilities are for the country. Therefore, it helps uh, think outside the box. And that's especially valuable since economic policy choices that were made during the second half of 1990s in South Africa have guided government's role in the economy until now. And those choices have had consequences and have underpinned the country's economic performance that we summarized. And, and, and beyond that, whether we're looking at the fiscal policies, or we're looking at the monetary policies, adoption of inflation, talk, whether we're talking about land reform, willing buyer, willing sellers, and uh, market price, or, or taxations and social security, all of these were the, the, from the framework that was uh, developed in, in the mid 90s and has basically informed policies and impacted uh, the, uh, the society as a whole. 
Now, continuing with the past economic policies is one of the options, of course, that, that we have used to assess the likely outcomes or the uh, outlook for it. But that's not the only option uh, that we have uh, available. And, 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 uh, and as a result, we basically have tested these possibilities by asking three what if uh, questions. So starting with the first, we say, well, what if the recovery plan continues with the post-1996 economic policy framework? What will be the likely economic outlook over the next uh, decade? Now here we are looking at basically looking at the policies that have been in effect over the years and, 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 and capturing that so that we can uh, use the tool to simulate the future possibility, the future impact, the likely impacts. And that means, for example, looking at the what if the government spending uh, on goods and services increases by average of half, uh, seven and a half percent as, as in, the, in the past or continues uh, 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 weak support of the industrial policy. How, what if the general government uh, economic and social infrastructure investment annually increases by 6% and the investments of the public corporations also annually increases over the next 10 years by 6%. What if the Reserve Bank continues with inflation targeting and credit extension to private sector continue to grow by the recent 6% annual growth uh, annual, annually? And, and what if the government continues with the current public works and social grant program? In other words, what if the, basically the, the, the same similar, same policies remain in effect over the next 10 years? So we quantify this, as you can see, these are quantified uh, expression of the, of the scenarios apply that uh, the model to it and produce projections over the next uh, 10 years. What we find uh, is that this, uh, this is, you know, the, uh, there are some growth in the economy, the average growth of the economy over the next 10 years would be about 2.2%. Uh, the unemployment uh, starts coming down from the COVID-19, the rise in the COVID-19, but by 2030, the unemployment rate still will be about 27%. Uh, Poverty rate also comes down from the COVID-19, but more than one third of the population will be still uh, below poverty, living below poverty uh, in, uh, by 2030. And the depth of poverty also continues to uh, remain high. So what, what we find is that basically this, this, the, this, this bourgeois scenario, this uh, that has some growth and, and, and uh, small reductions in poverty, a trickle down approach, uh, to the policies, uh, to uh, uh, scenario, will will uh, what what we will uh, see over the next uh, uh, ten years also implementation as that is that the, the economy will the indicators will tend to gravitate toward those the low growth and high rates of unemployment and poverty uh, established by that policy status quo. So we we ask the second questions. And then say, well, what if the recovery plan um, that we discussed augments the post-1996 economic policy framework with more austerity and, and contractionary measures? What will be the, uh, the likely economic outlook? Now, this scenario is, is also rooted, also one can see in terms of the economics of it, it also captures some of the, the uh, features of the current MTEF, uh, the pursuit of lowering the debt GDP ratio to uh, uh, major cuts uh, in, in the government uh, uh, various type of spending from uh, salaries to goods and services to, to uh, subsidies and, and to uh, uh, even uh, capitalist spending. Uh, so we captured this scenario of this possibility in terms of what if uh, relative to the business as usual scenario, the government cut by 10% spending on goods and services and, and uh, basically uh, uh, cuts the government's size of the economy, pursue a more uh, uh, 
free market uh, type of uh, uh, more uh, uh, even a more free market approach cut the government spending over the next 10 years by 10% spending on goods and services. Also reduce capital spending uh, instead of 6% uh, uh, before to 5%, uh, same reductions in the public uh, investment uh, corporations. Uh, also, what if the Reserve Bank tightened monetary policy by lowering the coin 6% upper bound for inflation to 4%, more, even more uh, uh, other uh, inflation targeting approach. And, and also what if the government abandons localization policies and it cuts subsidies and on products and productions by uh, 5%. Um, so this, these are uh, some of the features we captured to say we developed the what if scenarios and the scenario where the status quo, all the other policies stay as they are, it, it's just being augmented by more austere fiscal policies and more supply side economics, basically, which is captured by, by the two times, 2019 uh, uh, Treasury's document, uh, the essence of it. So what if that that is being, you know, over the next 10 years that we have that implemented, what would be the, the likely outcomes? And, and, and here, we, we, what, what, uh, we simulated the impact of these scenarios. These are quantitative scenarios, and, and we get uh, the, the projections. What you find is that the, it's the green results. The green trends are the results from the, the current, and the, the blue one are the, from the business as usual, the Isbuj or the earlier scenario. We see that the economic growth uh, will also, there will be some growth, but it will be even lower than the, uh, uh, the East Bourgeois scenario. The, the average growth rate drops to less than 2%, to about 1.8% over the next 10 years. The unemployment rate also comes down some, but will it stay higher, will be higher than the, 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 the business as usual East Bourgeois scenario. By 2030, it will be 29%. Poverty rate similarly will, will also be still by 2030, about 36.5% of the population will be in, in, in poverty and about 19, the death of poverty will be about 19%. So things will get worse basically. And that's that Guara Guara, therefore characteristics of the Guara Guara. So this scenario reflects, represents uh, in, in um, uh, the Guara uh, the Guara outcome. Worse, I mean, even things get worse than even uh, the, uh, the past. Uh, and and the, uh, the, uh, the 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 trickle down approach. Even this would be even worse. So the third question, therefore, we say, well, uh, what um, what if we've considered now the the business as usual and it's moving more to the right? What if the state reconsiders the post nineteen ninety six economic policy framework? What policy roadmap is likely to put the economy on an inclusive nail walk path? Now here uh, we we uh, we examined a, a large number of what if scenarios. Uh, we quickly found out that there is no silver bullet uh, that can solve a, a one policy initiative that can solve all the uh, the, the the problems uh, that uh, that exist. Um, so we tested a large number of these. Uh, our use of the model enables us to design and test hundreds of what if scenarios, and and therefore build up this uh, uh, six pillar framework, policy framework to bridge the current Guara Guara estate and the Naila Walk uh, future. Each pillar is, is basically built uh, on a set of specific what if uh, measures that I will try to summarize. Uh, for example, the, the macroeconomic uh, pillar of, the, uh, of this uh, Naila Walk scenario considers what if the government and public corporations systematically increase their investment in economic infrastructure and social infrastructure by 10% uh, annually over the next 10 years. Uh, what if the Reserve Bank, uh, Reserve Bank's current solitary mandate of tar targeting inflation is upgraded to a dual mandate of targeting inflation and 6% economic growth? What if the government spending on goods and services uh, annually increases by 10.5% uh, to provide necessary funding to expand the delivery of individuals and collective social services? And what if monetary authorities adopt measures to raise the annual growth of credit extension to private sector to 15%? So that 
in terms of a set of measures, we consider what if scenarios for the macroeconomics. With respect to the social policy measures, we considered what if the government begins to make public works the employer of last resort for the unskilled unemployed and, and increase the daily rate to 160 rand. Um, gradually over the next 10 years, the public uh, EPWP becomes employer plus for unskilled unemployed. What if the government immediately introduces an unemployment grant for skilled unemployed? And for all those who have uh, lost their jobs as in the due, uh, due to COVID-19. And the, the eligible unemployed workers will be entitled to uh, receive a hundred, uh, I mean, a thousand rand uh, a month. Um, we, the variation of this, we have also considered uh, as part of the social policy, what if the government introduces a universal basic income grant? And, and we have run simulations, and I think you have, some of you have received uh, those results uh, as part of like uh, this pillar of variations and uh, separate what if scenarios or additional. And, and, and also what if given COVID-19, the government immediately introduces a caregiver grant of 500 rand per month for the family members that take care of a child who receives either a child support grant or care dependency grant. Now, uh, just remember these are what if scenarios we consider these these are uh, one of the features of this approach is that the flexibility of it there are always possible to it is possible to consider other what if scenarios like the basic income grant that we were just i was just referring to but it, it, these are we can you know always uh, add or, or change or, or consider uh, additional uh, you know and additional uh, measures the third uh, me, uh, uh, pillar of this uh, 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 framework is with respect to macro, microeconomic policy measures, which is basically capturing the main uh, objectives or the main uh, the main um, uh, uh, interventions captured in the Treasury's 2019 uh, uh, document. What if the government sector supports policies help exports from the agriculture sector to grow by additional one percent? and by an additional half a percent following uh, 2021. What if the government macroeconomic measures were to succeed in lowering the price of transport, storage, and communication sector over the next 10 years by 5% to 10% initially, and then by an additional 5% annually? What if the government macroeconomic measures were to directly boost labor productivity in, in a number of, of strategic sectors that are listed there? What if macroeconomic policy reforms were to succeed in improving competitiveness in the following in the number of again strategic sectors identified sectors by the by the government these are basically captures exactly what the treasury proposed in its uh, document and we say well what if those materialize uh, uh, and and the government to be able to those uh, what would be the impact of it we will we will capture all of these at the same time simulating their impacts uh, after going over the the, the the pillars the fourth pillar captures the, the, the trade and industry policy measures uh, and, and basically saying what if the industrial policy measures such, uh, uh, such as uh, industrial financing incentives and others increase total annual investment in manufacturing sector by about 10 billion rands in, in constant prices annually. That it is a success. We give them benefit of doubt. The same thing with giving benefit of doubt on measures proposed for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, micro uh, uh, industry interventions. Here we said, what if they, these uh, the government um, is uh, help and and succeed these uh, these uh, uh, the trade and industry increase in uh, investment in manufacturing sector. What if trade and industrial policy measures such as the SEZ and African Integration Program were to succeed in increasing total export by an additional one and a half percent after 2021? Uh, what if the government, probably South Africa and localization policy succeed in gradually reducing import dependency ratio by, of sectors by 20% over the next 10 years? And what if the trade and industrial policy use a range of policy measures, including the public sector and public private sector investment policies to gradually increase the employment intensity of economic growth? Um, in terms of 
measures for the, the fifth uh, pillar looks at the, the contribution of private and international uh, to, to this uh, framework. And by looking at what if the, pub, uh, the, the PPGI, the Public Private Growth Initiative, were to increase investment in South African economy by 500 billion over the next 10 years? What if Public Investment Corporation, PIC, were to increase its investment in the South African manufacturing sector by 100 billion over the next five years? And, and what if the level of foreign direct investment in South Africa gradually increased from about 1% to 2.5% of the GDP over the next 10 years, gradually increases. Uh, the economy, as you will see, it will be growing. It will, it, South Africa will be in a thriving economy if we create that, that that's a reasonable uh, possibility as well. And, and what if uh, after COVID, the, the nominal value of the total world import grows by uh, annually by 8%. And finally, the sixth pillar is looking at the, uh, of this framework of Naylor Walk, is looking at the, the intervention, the support, the work that is going on at the, in the provinces, uh, provincial governments, growth and development plan. And then here we looked at one specific, the Gauteng, grow, uh, growing Gauteng together, 2030, GGT 2030, which includes uh, more than 160 uh, measures to uh, develop the industries, various corridors and, and agriculture help uh, various aspects of the economy. And, and, and here we say, again, giving it the same, what if the GGT 2030 industrial measures succeed increasing Gauteng's total real output by about half a percent in 2021 and by an additional half a percent annually? What if the combination of those measures, not expenditure measures, but the, the policy measures that are uh, other policy measures uh, succeed? What if provincial measures to promote African region trade succeed in increasing Gauteng export to Africa by an uh, uh, extra half a percent? What if extensive provincial sector strategies and support measures that are putting together lead to an additional half a percent annual investment uh, increase in, in Gauteng's uh, strategic sector, agriculture, food, electricity, water, construction, transportation, communication, and, and other sectors. Um, now, a combination of these, this, this gives us the, the six pillar uh, proposal, six pillar specific uh, measures, the roadmap, the policy roadmap, and, and we simulate that run the model on the basis of these measures. And, 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 and what we find is that these measures come uh, together, help the econ economic growth. As you can see, this is the, I'm presenting you with the two sets of results. One is a mild COVID scenario and severe COVID scenario. Uh, growth of the economy uh, uh, will be going, uh, the average growth increases to uh, 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 more than 6%. The, uh, the blue one is the East Bourgeois or uh, business as usual scenario. And the orange trend is, is the, the, uh, the uh, nail walk uh, six pillar uh, scenario. The unemployment rate, instead of tempering and, and ending up with 27 or 29% unemployment rate by 2030, it gradually comes down uh, to 12% uh, by 2030. Uh, uh, and, and, and also uh, the, oh, sorry, um, and 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 um, we we also uh, the uh, the the poverty also the uh, the poverty rate also instead of staying high it will it will over lower the poverty rate it will lower the scenario will lower poverty rate by almost fifty percent to twenty three percent and if for example the scenario that includes the uh, uh, basic income grants. Uh, scenario, it will also significantly have reduced even further. They uh, they they have a more uh, impact, a significant impact on, on poverty. Inequality also it reduces Gini coefficient uh, by about 16 percentage points, as you can see, continuing uh, uh, after you know after 2020, uh, gradually de uh, declining. They, so it has it provides basically higher growth. Uh, uh, significantly higher average growth rate, uh, significantly lower unemployment rate, uh, lower poverty rate and, and inequality. 
The scenario also, when you look at, uh, at uh, the overall scenario, the uh, framework, it produces simultaneously, it simultaneously expands both aggregate demand and aggregate supply, and it produces uh, the, uh, that balanced growth. Uh, and, and you can look at that from the aggregate demand side, the total expenditure in the economy from household, government, investments and, and exports and, and trade, and uh, against aggregate supply, production side of the economy, and you'll see that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the balance growth that results from the, the mix of demand and supply interventions in the economy and the dynamic effects of the two produces these uh, uh, endogenous outcomes of, of, of balanced growth. Uh, uh, in terms of fiscal and debt sustainability, uh, it's uh, important over the next decade, government revenue, we find that will obviously grow concurrently with projected GDP growth and thereby generating the funds needed to pay for scenarios expected increase in, in government expenditures. And, and this is uh, clear from here is that the bottom is the usual scenario, uh, the, the business as usual scenario, and on the top is the six pillar scenario. As you can see here from the, from the, income, from the uh, income side, which is reflected in the blue uh, bars, and the, the sixth below with the higher growth of the economy also means higher income, higher, higher tax revenue, and therefore the red bars, which are expenditures also uh, follow that uh, uh, it concurrently, it, it's funded mainly by the, uh, by the uh, expenditure side. And the, 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 the government expenditure and tax relative to GDP gradually, you know, are, are, are basically matching and, 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 and supporting each other. Uh, the debt GDP ratio as a result uh, relative to, to the business as usual, uh, or the other two scenarios, the six pillar uh, scenario uh, as a result of the higher economic growth, higher uh, lower interest rates and, and better primary balances produces lower debt GDP ratio. And, and, and here you'll see that the debt GDP ratio under the business as usual is usual scenario. It gradually, it, 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 it comes down from the current crisis from the, uh, the uh, uh, post COVID, but it stays pretty high around above 60%. While the, the under the uh, nail walk scenario with higher growth, uh, also the, 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 the debt GDP ratio is gradually declines and by 2030 is about 40%. Um, so when we're putting this together, we said in terms of indicators, we see that the, 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 the uh, significant change uh, the, the, that comes with this uh, six pillar. What does it mean uh, in terms of uh, different social groups? What does it mean in terms of uh, the, uh, the poor families? We think that the, this inclusive growth or uh, the nail walk scenario uh, will, will help uh, the, the, um, the poor families because because it, uh, the declines in the, in the poverty rate uh, to, by almost 50% to 23% by, uh, in the next 10 years, it reduces the poverty level uh, by about 10 million uh, by 40%. It's significant, it's significant improvement in the delivery of social services and economic infrastructure across the country will also, we think, particularly improve the living condition of the poor families. In terms of the, the uh, working class, uh, also, we think that the scenario significantly benefit the working class in the country because the unemployment rate declines by almost 70% from 35% and 40% under the severe scenario to 12% by 2030. The economy adds between 88.7 and 10 million jobs to total employment over the next decades. The, the in inequality drops by, by 16 percentage points. And again, significant improvement in the delivery of social services and economic infrastructure, we think helps uh, millions of working class family. We think the business also uh, stands to benefit from the, the Naylor walk, the six pillar scenario, because the size of the economy, the real GDP is, is, is expected to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to almost double over the next decades, which implies a significant expansion of the domestic market. The profit rate, the average profit rate remains healthy, uh, above 16, 16%. Investment in the economy and other, uh, in, in the economy and overall well-being of the population increase labor productivity. Government debt GDP ratio declines to less than, uh, gradually to less than 50%. Investment GDP ratio, 
uh, increases to about 27 percent and 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 all of these i think with the, the benefits that it has to the working class and 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 the society as a whole and the poor family it will also increase social cohesive cohesion that will help capital accumulation and 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 uh, so that the, uh, in terms of the overall picture, to summarize this thing in terms of the, the uh, to conclude it, we, there are different possibilities for South Africa's post-COVID-19 recovery. Uh, we use an, a model to identify these possibilities uh, with the help of Indulumiti uh, scenario. Our modeling results highlight three possible post-COVID-19 outlooks. We have an outlook, an East Bourgeois trickle-down outlook. If the recovery policy framework continues with the post-1996 policy, policy status quo, the past trickle-down path will resume after the pandemic with the economy stuck in low growth and high rates of unemployment, poverty, and inequality during the next decade. The second possibility is captured by the Guara Guara immiserizing outlook if the recovery policy framework augments the post-1996 policy status quo with contractionary measures such as the austere fiscal uh, policy, the, the future outlook will trend more towards an immiserizing growth path of Guara Guara scenario. And finally, the, uh, the, uh, the possibility of a nail walk for poor outlook if the recovery policy framework reflects a shift from the post-1996 policy status quo and embraces the policy framework similar to the six pillar scenario, the future outlook will trend more towards an inclusive purple path of nail walk scenario, enabling South Africa to recover from its chronic economic crisis. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Uh, Thank you very much, Asga, for that uh, presentation. We are 30 minutes behind schedule, but we are going to try and uh, mitigate as much as possible. We have a response from business, and this is in the form of a recorded uh, response from uh, Mr. Songyezo Zili from, uh, uh, from APSA. But we've noted the lively conversations on the chat function, which are largely in the form of suggestions, which is great because as much as we understand that there's a leadership deficit in terms of government, but it shows that we are all not willing to fold our arms while Rome burns. So what I'll do now is to allow the technical team to play the recorded message from Osongezo. Thank you. Good afternoon. First, let me recognize today's honored guest, President Khalima Motlat. I also wish to recognize the leadership of the Indula Miti South Africa Scenarios 2030 Trust, as well as all the honored guests today. On behalf of the APSA Group, I would like to thank everyone who was involved in this very important initiative. As much as the dreams, hopes, and aspirations of the South African people should be front and center of everything that we think about and do, it is equally important that some of us preoccupy ourselves with the task of trying to see what is around the corner, over the ridge, and over the hill. This is so we may always have an accurate perspective on the undercurrents and forces that are propelling us towards the future. The Indulamity scenarios is particularly important at this juncture where we are beginning to emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, the impact of which will be felt for decades to come. The economy, the labor market, as well as social cohesion are being severely tested and threatened. We released this report at a time when there is widespread social unrest in some of South Africa's provinces. This is but one of the symptoms of a challenged socioeconomic environment. I have one request of all the stakeholders who have a keen interest in the outcome of this exercise. And that request is that we all should apply ourselves with diligence and creativity 
to the insights that are provided in this report so that we may find new ways of collaborating and developing solutions that are going to help all of South Africa to develop and build the future of our dreams. This is not an easy task because interests are diverse and competing priorities are many. However, one of the lessons of individuality scenarios is that the challenge of leadership across all sectors of society is that we need to find the means, the space, and the time to collaborate, to find resources, and to do what is right for future generations. Our hope is that we will be able to choose the scenario that best represents South Africa's dreams and aspirations, and we work consistently and consciously to make sure that our beloved country gets there. Once again, I would like to thank the Indulamiti team and everyone who has offered support to this great initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Songyezo, for that uh, message of support, but also thank you so much for amplifying the need for the private sector, in particular big business, to also come to the party. Because as you've indicated, that we cannot uh, wait while we experience this leadership deficit in government. Now, what we are supposed to do now is to have a Q&A session, but we are behind schedule. We're supposed to have finished at two o'clock. However, I will still allow an engagement. I mean, there's been an active engagement in the chat function, and my colleagues from Indrila Meti have tried to field as many of those as possible. We also welcome all your suggestions, especially those that speak to the production of um, a booklet with the storylines or the South Africa we wish to have. But I'd also like to indicate that we're in the process of refreshing these scenarios because we are mindful of the fact that COVID-19 has intensified the effects of, uh, of the key driving forces. We found that some of the things that we uh, as uh, we imagined would happen, say, after the 2024 elections, are already starting to unfold. For example, our, um, our visit to the IMF, cap in hand, but also in terms of the fractures that we're experiencing in the past week or so. So there is that work that is currently in progress. So what I'd like to do now is to invite all the presenters or participants or speakers to turn on their cameras so that we can take one or two questions for each one of the speakers. We've also been looking at the chat function to identify if there's any questions that are directed at anyone in particular. And I've noted uh, myself about uh, four questions and I would call on my colleagues to respond to any of those. The one that, um, picked up on. The first one was asking whether COVID-19 is indeed a game changer. And that came from Yaqub Abba Omar. We also have quite a number of questions that were directed at the former president, Halima Mutlante, whom I know had another uh, commitment, but I'm hoping that he's still uh, able to participate in the session because he's still online. But the questions that are directed at him were beyond him uh, and his role as the former president, but also as the SG, former SG of the ANC, if there are any key lessons that he takes from what has been going on, especially when it comes to the events uh, of, the, of the past few days. Uh, there's uh, another question that came from Nikki Newton King, also about the current unrest, uh, asking about what can be done because there is a need for action beyond dialogue. We've been talking for a while now and we aren't quite known for um, indulging in dialogue or mahotas and so on. So how do we take action now? And she used the example of the Sasa payouts that might not be paid this week. So from my screen, I see uh, 
Dr. Soma Dodafigeni as the first person, followed by uh, Asta and, uh, and then uh, Tara. I see the former president is still with us. Uh, thank you for being with us. The question that was directed at you, they even said, I think it's uh, actually in, in terms of your role as Umkuluwa. So maybe we should uh, start with you and then we move on to Dr. Fikeni, and then I'll allow Tara and Aska to respond to any of those questions. But as noted, my, many questions have already been addressed on the chat function. Colonel, please repeat the question. I missed it. <laughs> you missed the question. The question was, what key lessons have you taken from not only the scenarios, but um, the activities that have been taking place in the recent past. And the second one linked to that is pointed at your role as the former SG of the ANC and also asking you what you think leadership should do in terms of mitigating the impacts of the most recent unrest. Hmm. Wow. That's that's quite an ask. <laughs> uh, well, the the key lessons really uh, that one takes away from uh, the recent activities uh, that uh, uh, includes uh, the 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 lootings. Uh, of, of the past couple of days, uh, is that, you know, we, we really need a and, 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 and for that uh, to, to happen, uh, the, prof, the late Professor Stan Sangwen uh, gave a very pointed uh, suggestion that uh, we, we got to uh, take away the mandate of appointing senior managers in the public service from the ministers. And uh, by proclamation, the president should uh, uh, <clears throat> move that to the public service commission and, and that the Public Service Commission should not itself conduct interviews, but put together panels uh, made up of experts uh, uh, on an ad hoc basis, but that would uh, conduct interviews uh, in the manner similar to what the Judicial Service Commission does uh, with regards to the appointment of judges. That was his suggestion as to how we can uh, at once uh, improve the capacity of the state and professionalize the bureaucracy. I think <clears throat> uh, uh, if you look at what happens at uh, a local government level, it is clear that we conflate uh, the political and administrative uh, functions. And, and, and so <clears throat> the, 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 we, we end up with uh, uh, very weak municipalities with no capacity whatsoever. And, and when we think of uh, local municipalities, we, we do not view them as part of a state. Uh, state that this is the most important uh, phase of the state where the communities and citizens uh, interact with uh, the, the, the state. And so <clears throat> that's, that's the... the, the uh, the, the events, recent events and, uh, and so on, uh, for me, uh, speak to this dying need to create a capable state 
Otherwise, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the confidence of uh, citizens in the uh, state uh, will forever be declining. And, and, and with the resultant uh, 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 <clears throat> resort to their own devices, and, and, and once that happens, uh, the anarchy prevails. Uh, the, the second part of, of, of the question uh, is, 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 is a bit more uh, involved. I, I think I'll take all of your time trying to, to respond to that one. Uh, I, all I can say is if, if the, the, the the ANC were to live by the prescripts of uh, its own constitution, uh, we, we would not be where we are today. Uh, <clears throat> because, you know, at, at, at at the moment, in recent times, uh, where the, the ANC operates uh, as though it has got no constitution. Uh, and, and to make matters worse, the ANC constitution is not aligned to the constitution of the Republic uh, in, a, in a very clear, explicit, uh, way. In fact, the the only part uh, where uh, any of the arms of the state are mentioned is caucus. That you know, in the legislatures or uh, parliament, you will have a caucus, and, and and that's about it. So, first step: the constitution of all political parties ought to be all constitutions of all political parties ought to be aligned to the constitution of the republic so that the constitution of the republic uh, is, is given its uh, 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 place of uh, eminence uh, in our polity. Uh, and otherwise, uh, yeah, let me stop there. Thank you so much, former president. Now I will move on to Dr. Fikenia, chairperson. There's a question here, and it was suggested that this one should be directed at you. There's this idea that we should never waste a national crisis. We now have an economy that is in dire straits. There's COVID-19. There's also the social unrest that we have spreading across the country in KZN in particular. It is all amplified by poverty and inequality as collaborated by our findings from the barometer and the storylines that we've been telling for the past three years. So what do you say about that suggestion that we should never waste a national crisis? Over to you, Dr. Figeni. Well, thank you very much. In fact, our documents, especially the ones on national dialogue and social compact, and including the survey as well as economic modeling is based on a premise that most countries have managed to focus their minds and pull themselves out of a crisis when they recognize opportunities that a crisis presents. So most of the country's reconstruction or even finding a need for a social compact comes out of a crisis. We would be wasting that opportunity at this moment if we are not able to come up with bold audacious intervention methods which are responding to the current crisis, but also resetting the pattern to make sure that we do not return to business as usual. And also, I just want to say that 
coming back to the issues of our key drivers. The problems we're facing are so complex and have been compounded by many factors with COVID-19 being one of those, that we should never allow a situation where we think that either the ruling party or government will solve these problems by themselves. It now needs every sector, business, civil society, trade unions, youth formations, to put their shoulder on the wagon, working with government, of course. And that in itself is key so that no one sits back and say, we will wait until it's the right moment. The right time is now because we face a crisis. And as the keynote speaker was saying, building the leadership capacity or resolving leadership problems, both in government, in the private sector, in the civil society will be key. And you are the leaders you've been waiting for. And secondly, building the capacity of the state in particular, and also the capacity of other entities, as you have seen that even audit firms are compromised, some businesses staying off and many others are compromised. So when we talk of building the capacity, we mean right across from a family level to the community level. And uh, I just want to say that in the current crisis, we've seen some glimmer of hope out of a crisis to say, when communities mobilize and stand up and see agency in themselves, you may actually build on that, especially making sure that it doesn't degenerate into vigilantism, but rather it's a community mobilization towards a positive end. Then government in its weaknesses can be bolstered by that, coming and coordinating its efforts with communities and business coming to the party. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Now, Ashka, I'm going to put you in the spotlight. There's a question from Mwele Zimbegi about why the ideal scenario is presented in your economic models. Why is this not adopted across the board? I know that you have indicated in your presentation that uh, Gauteng Provincial Government has taken up some of these lessons and has tried to apply it in their strategies. But why is it not something that has a ripple effect? Do you perhaps have any suggestions as to why? Please unmute yourself, Asta. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 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 uh. I'll also join in, in the response there, uh, but ask that first. Thank you, thank you, buddy, for my SG. It's a, I, I think, I think it is, it's, it's, the, the, the problem is not, uh, is the problem, uh, I think the way we have articulated the questions actually implicitly highlights the problem. Uh, and it's not just about this, this, alternatives, the problem with how the government actually engages with, proposed, with alternative proposals or uh, other uh, ideas from civil society, from academics, from uh, NGOs and uh, organized uh, 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 groups and others. And I think there has not been uh, the record in my view at least uh, is not that uh, uh, that that uh, that strong case. I think the 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 the, the policy consensus that were the policy the post uh, 1996 the gear that was uh, were the growth employment redistribution program that was adopted in 1996 has basically remained uh, unchanged, and it has been a very difficult to get the government to even consider what if, and that's why we put this in terms of what if. What if we consider alternatives and instead of ring fencing a whole range of policies and says the only thing left is to do some microeconomic changes and, and why not consider all what if scenarios that are possible because there is no silver bullet. There is no, for example, if anyone thinks that, that for example, that, that only 
macroeconomic ones, or, or micro, or, or for example, the uh, you know master plans from the, in the uh, trade and industry can solve all the problems. That is not the case. That's not, I don't think, at least from my experience and, and working on, on the South African economy the last 25 years, it's not, we have, that's why the six pillar is, 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 is I think resonates with a lot of people because it brings in the, the diversity of interventions that are needed. And there is a need for government to, to actually engage uh, critically, however, but, but in a productive, a positive way. This, uh, and, and I think that is not, that hasn't happened. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a uh, quick, uh, quick answer to that probably. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, uh, former SG, Buddy Lehort. Yes, uh, I, 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 I really have to elaborate on what Asda has said. Uh, when I was in government in 2015 and meeting Asda uh, after he had been met a number of times, I, I thought that uh, I should talk to our top policy guys, my counterparts, to look at what is a science driven institution and that we should think about modeling. And actually took people from State SA and BPME to where ASGA works to look at these models. And my team from State SA, he said, well, it looks like it will work. And I tried to uh, get this into government. Uh, the, 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 the situation was sealed. So I think that a few things. There is a level of uh, 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 capacity doesn't, that doesn't exist in the state. There is a monopoly of planning in treasury, which is not after all a planning entity. There must be the NPC and the, 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 the Department of Planning and Monitor. There is absence of planning in the core departments that have to do the planning. So we have surrendered all our powers to the treasury and uh, they are going to use up that power and use the fiscals to determine the plans. Unless we, dig, we get out of that mode, we are not going to go far. But I think also the scenarios in the way we constructed them before, like the memories of the future, the future we chose each way in government, they were not underpinned by quantification of the scenarios, which means the modeling part. Then the abandonment from about 2008 and going in government, meant that there was never going to be any scenarios or possibilities of quantifying anything. So all these are gaps that are systemic. And when we adopted the NDP, it was a single scenario. And if you have a single scenario, there's nothing as dangerous as that, especially then when you don't even implement it. If we try to implement it by itself as a single scenario, it was all also deficient. You need multiple scenarios, like three scenarios, to know where you are gravitating towards so that you can take corrective action. So I think in respect of the, this scenarios, we have two powerful things. First, building the scenarios, which means there is public participation uh, beyond uh, uh, parliament. Two, there is the barometer which measures them. Three, there is quantification, econometric quantification. Now, it is for the civil service parliament to ask the executive, what is the plan that you are delivering, delivering? That question never comes in parliament. And we applaud all the times, even for plans that don't make sense. So by going this route, the discipline will be there. But whether it will go into government as quickly as we wish, it's another matter. My experience is, there is still a war to, to fight in that respect. Uh, thanks. That's the former statistician general. Thank you for that. One last question to Tara about COVID, whether it was a game changer, but also to abuse my position as the chair. I'd also like to ask Tara if the barometer data was collected, say today, with all data available, would we get a different outcome? Over to you, Tara. Thank you, Molerwa. Uh, I think COVID has not been a game changer in terms of the underlying trends, particularly in social inequality. Uh, all of those trends have been there for 
decades, and certainly for the three years we've been tracking uh, the barometer. Um, and if the question then is, what is the one thing we can do most urgently right now to um, maximally uh, address the social situation as well as the political situation, I'd say it has to be food security. It has to be increasing household level food security across the country. And the fastest way to do that is to reintroduce the social relief of distress grant and move towards a, a, a universal basic grant. And in that way, COVID has been a game changer because it has enabled technological and policy level barriers to be removed to get a lot of uh, uh, cash to a lot of people very quickly. So that is something we can in fact do in a very short period of time. It just takes a decision to reintroduce something that was uh, introduced. In terms of if we did the barometer today with all data available, I, I think we would end up with the, the same result, a very similar result. Um, the, the, the barometer is specifically designed to be robust to um, <clears throat> changes in short-term fluctuations of attention, which is the whole point, and to uh, a different data situations. So we were very careful to make sure that um, any data that was missing this year was replaced with equivalent sources of information and that we are overall uh, confident in what we are saying, both about the indicators that are looking very bad, but also about those indicators that give us hope. And that say, we do still have a number of institutions that work well, that we can build on. And we have a number of ways in which uh, people's hope and sense and, and relationship with each other are positive and can be built on. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And thank you to everyone who's still with us for being so patient. We know we've run over time by about 40 minutes now. And uh, with that said, I'd like to inform you all that all the slides will be sent to all the participants in the next few days. The website is live and it does have the latest barometer result. And now I will hand over to our CEO, Andile Sangu, to give a vote of thanks and closing remarks. And that's it from my side. Thank you and goodbye. Um, thank you very much, um, Kolelo, and um, good afternoon to you all colleagues. Um, trying my best to move this. Um, a lot to say, um, here we meet again on the fourth anniversary of the launch of the Intulamiti scenarios that took place in June 2018. It feels as if it was a different world from the world that we are living in today. The events of the past few days are a grim reminder of how quickly the world that we see can change in a twinkle of an eye. And that is why it is important as a society and as a people to use scenario thinking as a way of a long-term thinking tool for the future where we can identify what possibilities exist for us in the future. Indulamiti is about looking above the trees. Indulamiti is about lifting our gaze above and beyond the current trajectory. Indulamiti is about thinking about the possible future pathways today and start thinking of ways that we can formulate appropriate responses to address the possible eventualities attached to each of the uh, particular future pathways. As you have heard today, we have three future pathways facing South Africa, 
We have the Isi Bujwa and an enclave bourgeoisie nation. We have the Guara Guara, the ups and downs of a false dawn. And we also have the Nile Walk, which is a nation that is in step with itself. So we are here today at the edge of the precipice. We are facing the abyss. It is up to us to choose the future we want, or to put it differently, the future we want is up to us to choose. Let us remember that even if we choose not to make a choice, we have made a choice. The time is now to collectively reach out to one another and join hands by working collectively to co-create for ourselves and our future generations, the future we desire. And that responsibility does not lie only with government. It lies with us all that we are here today and to the rest of the country. So you may ask the question, where to from now or where to from here? The time for social dialogue and for social combating is upon us. The new democratic South Africa is a product of a negotiated settlement. We need to urgently dialogue on the kind of economy and the society we want to have. It is not important or relevant anymore to ask the question, how did we get here? The fact of the matter is that we are here now. And the most relevant question to ask is where to from here? How do we rise again from the ashes like a phoenix and work hard and relentlessly to pursue the vision for our country that our forebears enshrined in the preamble to the constitution of the Republic of South Africa in 1996. I would like to take this opportunity to express a word of gratitude and uh, appreciation to former President Halima Motlante for agreeing to grace this occasion with his presence. We feel honored and privileged to have you in, in our midst uh, today, Your Excellency. Thank you very much for your analysis of the crisis that we are in. Thank you also for providing us with a call to action. We all have a responsibility to protect and defend our democracy. Thank you for your insights and for your sage advice and leadership. Let me also give uh, a word of gratitude to the members of EXCO, to the Board of Trustees of Intulamiti um, and the organizing team. Also to uh, express a word of gratitude to uh, everyone who attended the uh, event today and participated. But I want also more specifically to thank our sponsors for their support and financial commitment. The event that we are hosting today and the work of Indulamiti in general would not have happened or taken place without the support and financial commitment of our sponsors. Our sponsors, here are they, Herbert Smith Freeway Hills, Anglo-American, Remgro, NetBank, APSA, MediClinic, IDC, and Transnet.
we really appreciate your, your support, your faith and commitment to our work. As I conclude, I would like to invite you and request you to complete the client satisfaction survey. It's very important for us to keep on improving the work that we do, to also incorporate your suggestions. Also to advise you that we will be sending you the copy of all presentations via your emails, hopefully today. Also, please free to send us your comments or ideas on what more we need to do or where we can improve on the work that we do. We do not claim to be perfect. We do not claim to have all the answers. But one thing that we are prepared and commit ourselves to do is to listen and engage with you. And um, we also would like to hear from you how you would like to support the work of Indrulamiti. I also want to say as I, as I conclude that I'd like to invite you to visit our website to learn more about the Indrulamiti scenarios and also take advantage of the social media network platforms that you have access to to keep the conversations around scenarios and the choices that um, we need to, to make are live and, and ongoing. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The event has now drawn 